I'm sorry, but like when I think about seaweed clothing, I just think about like the seaweed strips you eat, like with rice and stuff. I'm like, it gets like any bit of like moisture on it at all. And it's just like slimy and sticks to you. Yeah, then exactly. you have the wet t shirt look going. The next Lady Gaga dress won't be of like steaks, it'll be of seaweed. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Fifth Wall Climate Tech Team Vodcast. I'm excited to have you here. My name's Christian Thatcher, I'm a VP on the investment team. Hey guys, I'm Cedric. And I'm Francesca. Let's jump into it. Saw an article this week on some different takes on sustainable leather, mainly one about a new form of leather alternative that's made from shrimp scales. What is your initial reaction on this? I mean, replacing leathers obviously would be a kind of great thing for reducing emissions of the fashion industry, which is, you know, one, I think it's the second most polluting industry in the world. And so kind of any way they can reduce emissions would be great. My first concerns around using shrimp is that farming shrimp, <laughs> I guess you'd have to like increase that quite a bit. And that might also be a kind of an issue. So that sort of be my first set of questions is around like how they're planning to scale that. Are there any impacts to the ecosystem if they start doing that like crazy uh, and what, what that might look like? And also, big one, if you're going to sell into fashion, what's the quality of the leather that's coming out of it? Is it good enough to be for you know Hermes to use because they obviously care about the level of quality that's being used? And then some other ideas of, you know, there have been other ways that people have come up with alternative leather. There's you can lab grown it. You can like use mycelium. Uh, there are kind of a couple of companies uh, in the U.S. here that are also doing that. <clears throat> Yeah, I think my first concern would be, is it smelly at all? <laughs> Crunch <Crunched laughs> shrimp and, and wearing that on your body, that seems that seems questionable. But I'm sure I'm sure that the team has figured it out. So well, you who smell am edible. I, who am I to say? Yeah, no, to, to set the scene, I mean, so the cheaply most widely used and most disposable material like polyester and nylon plastic are unfortunately made from fossil fuels on the the end of the life cycle, it becomes, you know, a major source for a lot of microplastic pollutions. We've seen all those videos about those major, you know, the five gyres in the ocean where it's just like basically floating islands of just plastic. Interestingly, apparel makers emit more greenhouse gases than both the aviation and shipping uh, industries combines. And it's, you know, estimated by 2050-ish, the fashion industry could use up a quarter of the world's carbon budget. Obviously a huge problem um, that we need to urgently, you know, fix. There's obviously so many different ways you can cut and dice it as to how exactly they should reduce it. One is obviously reducing the complexity of their supply chain because vast majority of clothing right now, and I don't know if folks know this, but it's that you, know, you make, let's say it's cotton even, which is already better than some of the petrochem stuff you're talking about here cotton, at least it's not kind of carbon emitting going straight into it, but it may be grown in India and then it go gets treated in Taiwan and then it's sent to Vietnam to be turned into actual clothes before it gets sent to the US. And so that complexity in the supply chain obviously creates a tremendous amount of emission. Um, and also the materials themselves. Cotton is better than polyester in terms of carbon emission, but there's also kind of other consequences to think about. A lot of water is used to grow cotton. It's taking away from food ag land. Um, it's taking mm-hmm. away from ag land. So there there are kind of some other ways to think about it. And then you also mentioned dyes. Runoff is also a big issue, of course. We don't even necessarily know exactly how to how bad that is. Yeah, all of the like the toxicity kind of runoff problems in the rivers and like India and seeing all these, you know, uh, child health um, issues is yeah, heartbreaking. Yeah, exactly. That article you read, just curious on how like these actual, you know, sustainable fabrics or materials are made. Uh, I mean, it's, it requires a lot of processing still. So you think about something from, and I imagine what they're doing is taking a, a shrimp farm, for instance. They're going to send off the shrimp. They're going to deshell that shrimp. And that usually would just probably go to a landfill. Then they're going to take that shrimp shell or exoskeleton and they're going to put it through some process where they're going to break it down to really probably a really fine particle of sorts. And then that will be then turned into some kind of fabric that they can weave um, or worked into other products that they can, you know, replace other, other like more unsustainable uh, end products with. Yeah. And the, there are other companies that are also using kind of plant-based materials to try and solve this problem. Like there's one I, that I remember, um, like Ruby Labs is trying to create a carbon negative thread. There are like, this company called Algeing that's trying to create a algae. There are also folks like Gailey that are lab-grown cotton, kind of all 
crazy new interesting ways to think of, rethink like the material itself. Yep. Yeah, we looked at um, when I was at BMW, we looked at mica works and then um, natural fiber welding. It's funny now that to, to see all of these mushroom products, especially I don't know if you guys are have been watching the latest and greatest HBO show, The Last of Us. Basically, mushrooms turning people into zombies. So, trying, trying to, fight, to fight the good fight by changing mushrooms into leather first. No, I was going to say um, a funny stat that I actually uh, someone told me recently is in the U.S. the amount of mushrooms that's eaten on by the average American per week is like two pounds per week. Relative to other countries, including Europe, it's almost double that. And then when you go to Asia, it's almost like twenty pounds per week for the average person. That's insane. It's a lot of mushrooms. I'll be honest, mushrooms is maybe my least favorite food in the world. (laughs) But it's my favorite. (laughs) Maybe I contribute to that number. I love mushrooms. (laughs) Yeah, I like mushrooms a lot too. But it wasn't a choir tasting. Like when I first tried a mushroom as a little kid, there's no way it's just going to happen. I think I only liked it on pizza. Now I'll add it to everything. Are you a fun guy? (laughs) (laughs) I'm a fun guy. Like Kawhi Leonard, I'm a very fun guy. One thing I can add to like the production of this, there's there's actually a lot of work going on in like the aquaculture space and actually being able to sustainably farm f- shrimp. And I think a lot of people see seaweed, seafood, seaweed even as part of seafood, as being ways to kind of address the gap in not world hunger isn't the right term for it, but just uh, address the, the protein gap that exists um, throughout the world, especially in more impoverished nations, right? It's like a very easy way to grow food is through the ocean. And obviously the ocean is so large. And so if that area continues to grow, then something like this in terms of fashion is actually a great idea because you potentially may have way more feedstock. But it goes back to Fran and yours original question is like, well, how expensive is it to take, you know, shrimp shells and turn it into fibers for clothes versus, you know, just growing cotton? Because I think with this classic thing that we'll say here right at Fifth Wall is like, well, we're not going to bet on anyone's altruism. We'll bet on the capitalism side way more, right? Um, and so, so that will be the big question on a lot of these solutions and things. And, and also, I would still also be curious around how it impacts the, the ecosystem still, right? Like if you're using so much of the ocean to do these things, we as human race really don't understand the ocean all that well, truly have no understanding of what we might be doing to harm it. And so I just feel like we should just like continue being careful when we're thinking about that. But I totally agree with you that algae and kind of other aquaculture things would be great um, kind of potential solutions. Algae in particular grows so fast <laughs> uh, that it's like it could quite easily um, start feeding a lot of different people. And it's pretty cheap um, to even now just to buy seaweed. One one question for you on this as well. Francesca, is, does sustainable fashion ever happen if fast fashion exists? <laughs> great question. <laughs> I would say that I really do. I think that's why a lot of it sits with the brands. If they can come up with better materials, um, if you're using algae and clothing, for example, I would assume it's biodegradable at that point because algae is. And so eventually when it gets sent to landfill, it can be dealt with. And the other part is like there are lots of brands like Trove, for example, that are trying to, or The Real Real, that are trying to increase resale. Because right now it's like 85% of clothing goes straight to landfill um, instead of kind of being recycled or put back into the system. Um, and the average item of clothing in the US is worn seven times. We can definitely wear that a few more times. <laughs> and even with fast fashion, just increasing usage out of it is sort of what brands like Trove are doing. And then companies like Cirque or Avenue um, are kind of on the recycling side of things to put all those materials back into original thread and back into the system. I think the way to think about it too, and, and I think there's going to be, have to do some like consumer education and consumer awareness, but it's, it's from a cost per wear perspective, right? Like looking at the, these like sustainable brands like Patagonia or, you know, Cotopaxi or Outer Known, where upfront, it might be a lot more expensive to buy like a shirt or a jacket. That shirt or jacket is going to last you like three to five years and you're going to wear it, you know, hundreds of times versus, you know, buying something from these fast fashion brands where you're going to throw it out next month. And so, yeah, there is the, the kind of fashionable trend and fad that, you know, you're always going to get new stuff, but fast fashion could actually be more expensive from a, from a cost per wear perspective. I completely agree. And there are, there's actually a consortium of brands that are trying to 
think about this a, a lot more thoughtfully and actually H&M is one of them for example and I feel like they have gotten a bad rap of in terms of how they necessarily handle their ESG and so it is definitely top of mind for people and I t- couldn't agree with you more in terms of the cost per wear like I'm wearing this jacket it's a leather jacket that was my grandmother's I think on a cost per wear basis both on the emissions and on the actual cost of it that's pretty good that <laughs> it's come through a couple generations at this point yeah but also vintage is just so back friend <laughs> that's true wearing yeah wearing wearing uh, your grandma's jacket is like the coolest thing now it's too funny what about um the other like so we talked about the shrimp shells what about the uh the seaweed uh clothing and their claim about you know you'll actually be able to get like vitamins and minerals by wearing seaweed clothing are we are we buying that I don't I don't know. Like I no, algae does do great things for your skin. A lot of beauty products have it in them, but I feel like you have to actually apply it for it to be good. It's same way I, I put, think about it, it's like we've been wearing polyester for a while. I really hope that carbon's not being absorbed through my skin with what everywhere. And I guess it's like areas that I just don't know super well. Yeah. I mean, how long do you have to wear a piece of, of clothing to actually like passively, you know, absorb the minerals and, and vitamins to make a difference? Like you're gonna be sleeping in it and yeah. It's just like your outer it's your inner layer of clothing that you wear all the time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that yeah. I don't like that. <laughs> Seaweed underwear. Yeah. That's the only way it works, but you can't change. (laughs) Inspired by Disney's The Little Mermaid. (laughs) Exactly. I'm sorry, but like when I think about seaweed clothing, I just think about like the seaweed strips you eat, like with rice and stuff. I'm like, could you imagine if that was like your clothing? It gets like any bit of like moisture on it at all. And it's just like slimy and sticks to you. <laughs> and that, it's no, a I, different look then, right? <laughs> yeah, then you exactly. have the wet t-shirt look going. Definitely not the look I'm after. But uh, someone could, might be after. There, there could be a market for it. I don't know. Maybe you know. Next, yeah, the Met Gala. Next, yeah, the next Lady Gaga dress won't be of like steaks; it'll be of seaweed. This is an HR conversation about to happen. <laughs> that is true. We should maybe but give I'll, it. I'll, I'll wrap it up. I will. That if your like New Year's resolution is to wear seaweed clothing to get vitamins and minerals to like boost your health, then you're probably wrong. I would say I agree that. If we put harmful chemicals on our clothes all the time and we're always wearing that, like, yeah, maybe there is some kind of like absorption there, toxicity that you could get. It's very minimal or de minimis amounts. Um, So maybe there's a little bit, but I I don't know if that's really ever going to be the selling point. I hope they stick more to the sustainability side of it versus the like, oh, you're going to get some minuscule amount of of vitamin out of it, vitamins out of it. Yeah. Well, one thing I would like about it too is kind of the more natural aspect of it, which like we haven't really discussed. It's that seaweed has a color to it. So how much do you need to dye it? Like, does it absorb color in a different and better way? Um, and I feel like the dyeing part, because if you don't wash your clothes when you first buy them, like fast fashion in particular, sometimes it will actually dye your skin. And so like, if you can remove that element, that'd be great. Yeah. So, so Fran, I, I know we don't uh, invest in kind of sustainable fashion, but is there anything we can do or any port codes can do to kind of just elevate and pr- promote, you know, sustainability in this broader space. All right. Well, shameless plug quickly on this one <laughs> um, is that at first of all, we actually have a portfolio company called Material Bank, which is a marketplace for a lot of building materials, but also for furniture and also for textiles. That's kind of one way is that if you are a supplier or um, a brand and you can use those kind of secondhand materials, it would reduce your carbon footprint. So that's kind of one shameless plug. The other one is that we have a portfolio company that's coming at it from a very different angle, which um, is EcoCart. They are an API plugin to kind of your uh, shopping cart when you do e-commerce and you can offset all your, your emissions as the end consumer. Say like, I'm going to offset the fact that this is being shipped over from Australia, wherever it may be, um, and actually do some good for the world with your purchase as well. I am starving. Anyone got any uh, big dinner plans for tonight? <laughs> yeah, I'm going to go to Hot Pot with a couple of friends this evening. Um, it's actually one of my last nights in New York for a while. So going to make the most of it. <laughs> that was a pretty smooth transition. <laughs> yeah. As far as transition goes, that's pretty smooth. Let's uh, pull this to our next topic here. Crazy that you mentioned Hot Pot because I just read an article where people in China are making jet fuel with leftover Hot Pot. 
basically like China consumes more edible oil than any other country, which is believable, but also insane. Um, and that the city of Chengdu produces about 12,000 tons of waste oil each month from just hot pot. Fred, since you're having hot pot for those who don't know, do you want to just give a, a quick rundown on, on what exactly is hot pot? The hot pot's basically kind of this format that you have a soup based, or some people call it soup based. I kind of call, think of it as more like the thing that I cook with, but there's flavor to it. And you can pick the spicy flavor or whatever flavor you want to go with. And then you cook your meat, vegetables, whatever else, ingredients, fish balls in that. Um, and then you kind of have a dipping sauce that you use and that that's hot pot. <laughs> and at the end of it, I'm assuming it it is pretty greasy just given all the sauces, the meats, all the ingredients that you're putting in. Yeah, I personally love uh, cooking with lamb and beef when I do hot pot. There's a lot of fat when you cook lamb and beef that comes out into the soup. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was going to say, Christian, I know you drink the soup. and You can drink it. It's not like it's bad, but there is a lot of oil. You don't have to drink it. <laughs> it's optional. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, maybe it's a cultural thing. You kind of, you know, you just have a soup in general, like you finish the whole soup, but it uh, makes sense that you wouldn't do that with a hot pot because it's just all the grease. That, cause you, I mean, you could be using it multiple times, right, through the, the dinner, right? Like keep adding more things, different combination, you scoop that out, put it in your bowl, eat it, right? Wait, do you change the soup during your hot pot dinner? No, no I'm saying they don't always change the soup, right? Like, oh. No, no, they definitely don't. They just add hot water to the flavor. Christian's bod made by hot pot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah I was like, what? Do you feel good after drinking the soup? No, okay, so I want to just clarify that hot pot, right, in the middle of the table, cooking all the stuff, then you scoop out of the center location into your bowl. Do you not just, like, finish your bowl? You use that, like, net ladle. <laughs> I'm trying to <laughs> Do you not use a net ladle and chopsticks? I haven't done a lot of hot pots. I definitely was using chopsticks, but I can't remember if it's going to give the jets that much energy. Like, why couldn't it give me that much energy too? That's how that's how you're doing all of these triathlons. Yeah, why couldn't I use that as fuel as well? I think it probably had the opposite effect on you. It's called, it's called SCF, Sustainable Christian Fuel. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this is a big problem for all restaurants, right? You think of a restaurant, any restaurant, you know, especially here in the United States, you can think of like a grease trap for someone that's cooking French fries. There is a big grease bin in the back of that restaurant. What was happening previously in China over many years is a lot of that was just getting dumped, not getting properly disposed of. And so businesses were actually started around collecting that dumped or wasted oil like that could have been you know on the street or in a gutter or something and they were sifting it out and filtering it to a certain level right like filtering it and then actually selling it to hotels and other people to reuse the oil which is absolutely disgusting to think that that was happening luckily the the chinese authorities kind of cracked down on this in 2016 and said, okay, well, we need a solution to this waste stream. And one of those solutions they came up with was, oh, we can actually turn this into sustainable aviation fuel. I'm glad they did because that is gnarly. <laughs> I wonder if they could use it for other types of oil too. Like, does it have to be uh, hot pot oil? Is it like, does it need the spiciness or something? Um, or the like, uh, is it animal fat that's working there? Or can we use French fries oil? Because if that's the case, feels like we got a lot of other, like, we could expand into um, the US with that as well. Well, that, yeah. So the, you can use a lot of like vegetable oils or French fry oils. Um, there's process to, to produce sustainable aviation fuel called HIFA, um, which is basically where they just process all of these fats. It is you know, somewhat cost intensive. And so, you know, companies are still still working on getting it down to cost parity just because, you know, if you are selling that into a commodity market, like you need to be able to, to com compete on cost. And it's almost there, but not, not there yet. And it's truly agnostic. So I was like, is it, uh, is there certain types of vegetable oils that the cost is lower? <laughs> like, is that, especially with hot pot, I'm just thinking there's so much other stuff in there that it might be... Um, yeah, it just might be adding a level of complexity. Oh yeah, for sure. There's going to have to be so much processing to to get the the hot pot waste to you know yeah be able to yeah to pour it into a, a jet engine and actually run. 
but I would say it, I'm much happier that it's going into a jet engine than into like other humans yeah, uh, as yeah, a waste stream. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. The lesser yeah, of two I think, I think, sure. Yeah. Yeah. I no, I think this is a super creative and and great uh, alternative to just wasting it. The cost thing will always be an issue, but I think sometimes people are lots of times people are actually able to pay a premium as like some of these airlines are trying to reduce their carbon emissions, have very aggressive uh, carbon emission reduction plans. I think the real issue is like how much volume would we really be able to get here? They predict that, you know, food waste and oils would only be able to produce maybe 2% of the total market. So, creative solution, really great alternative. There's teams in New York that go around restaurants and and uh, near airports and stuff to collect grease and, and uh, things like this to do sustainable aviation fuel in the United States as well. But at the end of the day, it's only 2% of what we're going to need to really move the needle. I think bottom line there is, Fran, you got to bump up those hot pot numbers. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I can work on it. Yeah. Yeah. Bump up the hot pot numbers, reduce my uh, flying around. We can move the needle maybe <laughs> one person at a time. Do you think this is okay, this converting uh, food oil into sustainable aviation fuel is a sustainable, uh, is an investable business? Hard maybe. I think there's a lot of, uh, I mean, a lot of companies are, are exploring, you know, more direct ways to generate sustainable aviation fuel. They're taking, you know, hydrogen and combining it with CO2 and kind of an electrochemistry, uh, electrochemical processes to, uh, result in in SAF, um, which I think are going to be more direct processes and more you know and cheaper. So I think definitely yes to the broader sustainable aviation fuel space, but TBD on hot pot to SAF. I would I would agree with Cedric on that. I think that there there will be some interesting opportunities here. Um, not only from a sustainability standpoint, but as an, a, an investing standpoint as well. Um, and then just kind of curious to see how, you know, what happens to a hot pot sustainable aviation fuel solution when, you know, green hydrogen, better batteries, electrification of everything continues to kind of propagate throughout all industries, including uh, flight as well. So that was literally going to be my point, Christian, was around like what, <laughs> what percentage of the each, which, which percentage of the stack is it going to be like sustainable aviation fuel versus to your point, hydrogen, electrification, or even just improving efficiency um, of a lot of these uh, airplanes. Yeah, well, maybe we'll have to close this discussion over some hot pots. I'm down. That sounds great. <laughs>